The 12th century saw an extraordinary renaissance in castle building. This was the age of the Great Stone Tower. Rochester Castle in Kent was one of the earliest and most impressive. It dwarfed every building for miles around and intimidated all who lived in its shadow. Even today, this castle is by far the biggest building in Rochester. It totally dominates the town. But back in the 12th century, this building was the tallest castle in the kingdom. At 35 metres tall, it was the skyscraper of its age. It was designed to be utterly impregnable. But in one of the greatest sieges of the entire Middle Ages, Rochester Castle was put to the ultimate test. I grew up in Kent and I used to live near Rochester. My parents would often take me to the castle at weekends. Even back then, I could sense the magic of the place. Later, as a grown-up medieval historian, I learnt that Rochester was a building that had shaped the course of British history. In 1215, a siege took place here between a group of rebels and the notorious King John. The future of the kingdom was decided by whether Rochester stood or fell. In this siege, King John was prepared to go all the way. He deployed the most sophisticated weapons and tactics of the age, from the terrifying medieval catapult or trebuchet to the highly dangerous technique of undermining. Yet the outcome of this enormous struggle was ultimately decided by a herd of 40 pigs. Most of the castles built after the Norman conquest were made of earth and timber and they were very effective. However, they weren't exactly the last word in comfort and they were far from being invulnerable. There was always the risk of attack with fire. So in order to get even more comfort and to get even greater security, the solution was a simple one, to rebuild in stone. Those that could afford to do so abandoned the Motton Bailey and invested in a new type of building altogether, the Great Stone Tower. Rochester is very special in every way. As well as being the tallest tower of its kind, it was also one of the earliest. Built from 1127, it was a palatial residence for the Archbishop of Canterbury, one of the most powerful lords in the kingdom. Situated on the mouth of the River Medway, the castle controlled vital road and river routes. Anyone wanting to control southern England had to control Rochester Castle. Now the first thing you notice when you try and get into Rochester Castle is that the doorway is about 15 feet up in the air and in front of the doorway there's this huge gap where the drawbridge would have been. And you already start to appreciate that this is a very well defended building. It's a building designed to keep people out. And as you come in to the castle, you don't actually come into the keep itself, you come into a building on front of the keep which is called the Four Building. And it's built with two purposes in mind. One. It's designed to impress, and you can see, even though it's a gift shop today, it's still very impressive architecturally, very nice, elaborate archways. And it's also intended to protect the entrance to the keep itself. So if you come into the keep, look up there, there's a slot in the ceiling where the portcullis would have been. And look at the thickness of the walls of the keep. They've got to be about oh, 12 feet thick. you're struck, of course, immediately by the huge size of the interior. And then you notice this wall across the middle, and you realise that what you're looking at is only half the interior space, because the keep goes on twice as much again that way. And you can appreciate the huge size because there's no floors anymore. They were all burnt out at some point after the Middle Ages. But what that does enable you to do is to look around the keep and sort of work out how clever the design of the whole thing was. So if you start down there, you can see that there's a well in the centre of the keep, not outside, so you've got water even if the outside of the castle falls in a siege situation and you've got running water on every floor. Now from up here you can see 
the best floors of the castle. This is the Great Hall. At this point, the cross wall breaks into these great arches, and you can get right across between the two halves of the keep. This hall is where the lord, the owner of the castle, would have entertained, would have held elaborate feasts. And the third floor, that is where the principal sleeping accommodation would have been. In effect, like a penthouse apartment for the lord and his immediate family. The uh, smallest room in the keep. This is the uh, toilet, of course. There are three toilets at Rochester Castle, and they all discharge that way out the wall because the nice residential accommodation is that side of the castle. But even so, having internal toilets uh, means you don't have to traipse outside to the bailey in the middle of the night when you get caught short. Of course, the tower only contained the castle's principal rooms. It was not intended to stand alone. As with castles of earth and timber, it was surrounded by a larger enclosure called a bailey, which housed the other essential buildings, like kitchens, storerooms and stables. Although Rochester is one of the oldest stone towers in Britain, it is not the earliest. That honour goes to the most famous of them all, the Tower of London. Built from the 1070s by William the Conqueror and his sons, this prototype keep was inspired by two quite different feelings. Its grandeur reflects the pride that William took in his achievement. But the decision to stack all the parts of a palace complex on top of one another and wrap them in thick stone walls indicates that the Normans also lived in fear of attack. Now, by the time you reach the 1130s, the prototype, which was the Tower of London, has started to settle down into an archetype, like Rochester. In other words, you've got a standard design of castle which is going to dominate the rest of the 12th century. And in terms of design, it's almost perfect. A very small number of men can hold out against a very large army indeed, using a castle like this. So what was the military thinking behind the design of the stone tower? With a tower like Rochester, what you're looking at is a citadel kind of defence. It's the heart of the defence. It's intended that nobody should be able to break into it. It's tall, it's got thick walls, and essentially the message it sends out is, you know, have a go if you think you're hard enough. Conventional methods of attack that might have worked against wooden castles would have been useless against a stone keep like Rochester. Charging the castle on foot would be a pretty disastrous thing to do. You've got to remember that it's defended by archers shooting out through arrow loops from the building itself, so I don't think you'd make it very close. You could try and break in through the doorway, but the keep's well defended against a battering ram because the entrance is far off the ground. When they came close to the keep, they would suffer a barrage of, of missiles, stones and other weapons. I mean, everybody thinks of boiling oil. That was probably less likely, but it was that kind of thing that soldiers had to deal with in the face. You could use archery and crossbows against the defenders of the keep, but they're behind thick walls with very narrow slits that they're shooting out of, so you'd have to be very lucky indeed to get anything inside. The stone tower was such a successful design that between 1120 and 1220, more than 50 of them were constructed throughout the country, from Porchester in the south to Norham in the north. But not every lord could afford to build on this scale because of the enormous cost. Now, we don't have any written information specifically for Rochester Castle, but we do have written records for castles built slightly later, towards the end of the 12th century, because we have exchequer rolls like this one, which are basically an annual audit of the kingdom. And they start from 1154 and run in an unbroken sequence. Now, these things are fantastic. This roll itself is about 850 years old. And using it, which is something of a challenge, we can find exact costs for castles built in the later 12th century. I want the membrane for Norfolk and Suffolk, and we've gone too far. Four. Now I'm looking for a castle called Orford. There it is, Orford, almost the modern spelling. My Latin is not great, but for the works at the castle of Orford, 26 pounds, 13 shillings, and fourpence. Now, if you go through all the rolls, you get a total of about £1,500. 
So Orford's a slightly smaller castle than Rochester. What I'm going to do is look for a castle which is slightly bigger than Rochester. Oh, I've forgotten this bit. You often get instructions from the king to the clerks of the exchequer to search the rolls for information. And that must have been a great job. The person who introduced books rather than rolls must have been bought a big round of drinks, I imagine. Now this roll is for 20 years later, and we're interested in Dover Castle. And if you work through all the rolls for Dover, you get a total cost of £4,000. So Rochester is slightly smaller than Dover, bigger than Orford, costs about, I reckon, £3,000, and probably took about eight, nine, maybe even as many as ten years to build. Now, £3,000 doesn't sound like a lot of money, but in the 12th century, an unskilled labourer earned about a penny a day, a skilled labourer took home twopence, and a fully armed knight would have expected to earn a shilling or 12 pence for a day's work. At the other end of the scale, the king had an income of about £10,000. So a building like Rochester Castle, costing £3,000, absorbed about 30% of the national budget. That's a colossal sum of money. Castles like Rochester weren't just highly efficient defensive structures, they were also lavish residences. They weren't the dark, dank dungeons that you get on film and TV. They were palaces, in effect, the last word in medieval luxury. It would be fascinating to know exactly what Rochester looked like during its heyday in the 12th and 13th centuries we can get a very good idea by travelling to Headingham Castle in Essex. Still owned by the descendants of its original builder, this is one of the best-preserved 12th century towers in England. Come in and take a look at this. Headingham Castle is in amazing nick. It was built just a few years after Rochester, almost contemporary. More than anywhere else in England, I think, you really get a sense of the luxury of medieval living at the top of society. I mean, look, look at the detail in this carving. It's like it was carved yesterday, and yet it was carved 850 years ago. And over here, this fantastic fireplace. Again, think back to Rochester. Think how worn away all these kind of details were, and look at this one. Rochester has had to put up with the wind, the rain, for hundreds of years because the floors disappeared. Whereas Headingham, the owners have managed to keep the floors. And just take a look at this. This is the centrepiece of the room, a fantastic Norman arch. The biggest Norman arch in all of England. It's sometimes assumed that great lords lived in castles all year round. But in order to feed their great households, the aristocracy had to move around their widespread estates. So a castle like Headingham or Rochester stood empty for most of the year, maintained by only a skeleton staff. On rare occasions, however, horsemen would arrive, bearing the news that their lord was on his way. The arrival of a lord and his household at the castle would have been rather like a rock star turning up at a modern hotel today. All of their whims would have to be catered for. cellars would have been stacked with wine. The bakers would have been sent a few days in advance of the household in order to have enough bread ready for when the Lord arrived, and the larder would have been packed with meat and fish. When the Lord and his household finally arrived, this would have been the focus of their activity, the Great Hall. This is where they would have dined, with the Lord and his lady sat at the high table. Such was the life of the nobility. They rode, they hunted, they feasted, they led comfortable and peaceful lives. It's one of the great myths about the Middle Ages that the nobility loved nothing better than to start fighting against the king, or failing that, start fighting each other. They depend on their prowess on the battlefield to justify their place in society. But their landlords, their farmers, in order to build nice castles, they rely on a steady income, they rely on peace. However, principles and politics could force men to resort to arms. When they did so, castles became all important, and warfare was all about the struggle to control them. During the reign of the notorious King John, a political storm began to develop that would ultimately bring war right to the gates of Rochester Castle. <laughs> 
Most of the time, a castle like Rochester was a very pleasant and a very peaceful place to live. If you want an idea of how rare sieges were in the Middle Ages, think about this. That castle has been there 900 years, and in that time it's been besieged just three times. Now, the biggest of those three sieges took place in the autumn of the year 1215. But it wasn't just the biggest siege that Rochester had ever seen. It was one of the biggest sieges of the entire Middle Ages. In 1215, a number of England's leading noblemen decided that they had had quite enough of King John. They seized London and forced the king to negotiate. This was no idle squabble, but an argument about the very nature of English government. The rebels presented their grievances to John in what later became one of the most famous documents in English history. Magna Carta, the Great Charter, the cornerstone of an Englishman's liberties, the basis of England's constitution, and a potent symbol of freedom over oppression and tyranny. Yeah, well, OK, that may be true, but I think it's important that we see Magna Carta in 1215 as what it was, not what it came to symbolise later. In 1215, this was a practical, working document. The barons had real material grievances against the king. Now, you can see some of those grievances if you look here at the first clauses. A lot of them are concerned with limiting the king's ability to get money out of people. Now, I think a lot of those clauses are John's fault. He taxed his country far too hard in order to pay for an unsuccessful war against the King of France. John had been quite happy to make laws for other people, but then equally happy to break them when it suited him. And if you look here, you've got the two famous clauses in the middle of the Charter. Nobody will be imprisoned without judgment. And over here, John promises that to no one will he sell, deny or delay justice. And at the bottom of the Charter, you have the dating clause that says, given in a field between Windsor and Staines called Runnymede, which, as you can see, has changed very little over the last 800 years. And it was here that John put his seal to Magna Carta, indicating that he had every intention of keeping it. Unfortunately, a promise like that from King John wasn't really worth the parchment it was written on. He had absolutely no intention of keeping the Magna Carta. He immediately wrote to the Pope to get the whole thing torn up. The barons, realising that this scheme had failed, implemented Plan B, and that was to make someone else king. They invited the son of the King of France, Prince Louis, to be their king instead of John. The scene was set for a bloody and difficult war. Control of the southeast was critical. Both sides were expecting aid from the continent, the rebels from Prince Louis and the king from his foreign mercenaries. With John at Dover and his opponents in London, Rochester Castle was the key. The rebels realised that they had to block the road to London to prevent John from attacking them. Rochester controlled this vital road. The rebels had to get to the castle and take control before John did. One of the rebel leaders, William de Albini, made a dash from London to Rochester with a troop of a hundred knights. The fact that Albini was chosen or volunteered to lead this expedition indicates that he must have been a very skilled warrior. But it's difficult to work out exactly what his own motivation was. He had been one of the 25 men who had been entrusted with the enforcement of Magna Carta, but then he only joined the rebellion a week before Runnymede, and he didn't seem to have any of the personal grudges that other rebels had. But whatever his own grudges were, there was no doubting his commitment to the cause. On the 11th of October, his men entered Rochester Castle. Two days later, John was at the gates. Just because an army rolls up outside a castle doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a siege. In a lot of cases, the defenders are going to look out from inside and think, gosh, there's way too many of them, we might as well give up. Or alternatively, the attacker's going to turn up and think, well, that castle is really way too strong for me to break with this number of men, I might as well move on. But in this case, William de Albini and his knights look around and look at these walls and think, they're strong enough, we'll be okay, we'll be able to hold out. And John, outside, looks at the same walls and thinks, they're not strong enough, I'm going to be able to break them. And then you get a siege. But even with his enormous resources, how did John think he was going to break this massive tower? Rochester is a wonderful siege to investigate. Not just because it was one of the biggest sieges of the Middle Ages, but because the evidence we have is so good. In the first place, we've got monastic chronicles. Now, chroniclers are rather like the journalists of their age. Some of them are really accurate, others of them make it up as they go along. 
But with Rochester in 1215, we've got a really good idea of the way the story unfolds because the reporting is so good. For example, we know from the outrage of one contemporary writer that John stabled his horses in Rochester Cathedral. Well, this is Bowley Hill, and this is probably where John's camp, in fact, I'm certain this is where John's camp was. Of course, there's no maps or plans to indicate where the king drew up his troops, but in terms of strategy, this is the obvious place. This is where the ground is highest in relation to the keep, and it's also where the keep is closest to the curtain wall, so there's less, you know, you can get the, the missiles, projectiles. This is where you're going to get your best shot. All the might that the king could muster was arrayed against just 150 defenders who had had only two days to gather supplies and prepare themselves for the impending onslaught. Being in a besieged castle was an agonising waiting game. The chance of a surprise attack meant that you had to be prepared at all times and getting into your armour could be a lengthy process. Need to bend forward right, and then let gravity do the work. I think I probably should take my glasses off first. I thought I had them on last time. <laughs> Try again. Enormously heavy. About 25 kilos. Okay. And get your arms in first. Okay, that requires some finding the arm holes. Yeah. Right, that seems to be one arm fruit. Well done. Well, you should be used to doing this from boyhood, of course. Oh, uh, yeah. But, uh, I think both of us are a little out of practice when it comes to donning mail shirts. All right, we're trying. Answer it first. Let gravity do the work for you. And the other arm? Another one. There's the arm. Right. All right, that's the second one. That's it. <laughs> Over the uh, quilted gamberson. Are you sure this isn't in a knot? This is the integral coif. Yeah, that's it. Jump up and down a bit. That's gravity Lovely. working. Now, Excellent. It's a lot less heavy when it's on. This is a dead weight. But yeah. once it's on the body, the, the weight is fairly evenly distributed. The trouble with it is it does drag from the shoulders. Right. So you definitely need this quilted, padded gambeson underneath. Yeah, that's true. That's, it, it does actually feel quite comfortable. Now, the helmet. Uh, this is the, the archetypal 1066 Norman conical helmet with the, the fixed nasal. This is pretty old-fashioned by 1215 or bang up to date, something with a face guard. This is really what's going to shape the, the form of helmets for the next 50 so to 100 years. This is the great helmet. If I take my glasses off, and you get an idea. Um, my head's too and big. Your head's too big. Yeah, it's too big. <laughs> this is a, this so is a small size helmet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very much a period of transition. There's lots of experimentation going on. So what have they got to use if John's men do get into the castle? This would be bang up to date. Right. This is based on an example in the Vienna Imperial Treasury, 1198 to 1215. Right. It's a very expensive weapon. Okay, so is there anything else that uh, a, a knight would have been carrying? Probably either a mace or axe. Mm -hmm. This is actually an original, probably 12th century. If this we is turn a, it an to original here, 12th century. This yeah. is. You can actually see a, a steel edge that's yeah. been hammer welded onto this iron blade. Amazing. 800 years old. That's right. Still with us. And of course, the wooden shield. And wooden shield, which many people, of course, and are much beloved of Hollywood films, they think they're metal. Right. Clang, clang, clang. They're not, of course. But they're they're wood, sometimes covered with textile or leather. When they've actually stormed that breach, it's hand to hand. So I don't think that you want to go there without your your sword, axe, or mace. While Albini and his men prepared themselves inside the castle, John made sure he had the outer wall surrounded to prevent any escape. Well, with the siege underway, Rochester takes on a whole new aspect. All the luxury is now gone, all the sense of fine living disappears. The palace now takes on the feel of a barracks, You've got maybe 100, 150 people crammed within these walls. So food has to be rationed. There's no extravagance, no feasting anymore. And at night, when people have to bed down, normally people sleep on the floor, but there are no rushes. There's no firewood to keep them warm through the night. They're wrapped up, huddled in their cloaks, trying to keep as warm as possible. The king was ready to begin his assault. We know exactly what he did first. <laughs> 
from the start of John's reign, we have chance revolves, which is a copy of every order that John sends out. We've got the date and the place so we can track John's movements exactly. So we know that John arrived at Rochester on the 13th of October. And on the 14th of October, he sent this writ, King to the men of Canterbury, we order you that, just as you love us, immediately that you see these letters, you will cause to be made by day and night all the picks that you can. And then here he goes on to say that the smiths in the city of Canterbury should stop all other work except for the manufacture of picks and send them to us at Rochester as quickly as possible. Given by our hand at Rochester on the 14th of October, 1215. We can guess what those pickaxes were for. The king was going to try and force his way into Rochester Castle. John was a terrible king, and he wasn't a particularly good military commander either. But at the same time, he wasn't a man to be crossed. He could be cruel, he could be stubborn, and in this case, he proved determined. His men used their picks to get through the outer wall of the bailey and drive the defenders inside and back to the keep. John knew that getting inside that thing was going to be a lot harder. Round one had gone to John. So how would Albini's men have coped with the pressure that the king was piling on them? You've been in situations similar to the ones that the men faced in 1215. So they've fallen back to the keep, the bailey's gone. I mean, how's that going to affect their confidence? Well, that would have sapped their morale. They have had one setback, and possibly they're now thinking about losing the battle. Tension will be mounting, and really people beginning to get frightened. How do you cope with that kind of fear? Well, the first thing a soldier falls back on is his training. Training in battle drills, carrying out familiar routines, and, of course, looking to the example of other soldiers. Knights in the Middle Ages haven't necessarily faced anything like this because they're such rare events. How does a commanding officer try and keep the morale up when it's a totally new experience? Well, mainly through his physical presence and his own personal leadership qualities. He is the key figure. He has to instill confidence in the soldiers by displaying outward self-confidence in not only his own abilities, his soldiers' abilities, but also the outcome of the battle as well. So a man like William Daldini must have been a fairly charismatic figure to hold these men together for two whole months. Uh, command in this sort of situation, in a siege situation, must be one of the greatest challenges a military leader can face. But Albini's men had a lethal device that would have prevented the king from getting too close. It was a weapon that had recently made a huge technological leap forward the crossbow. Crossbows were probably introduced to England after the Norman Conquest. But since the late 12th century, a new method of construction had massively increased their power. What went before was a purely simple wooden prod, made of one piece of timber, and that would form the motive power for an early crossbow. So this would have been, the, the bow would have been drawn back this way? Ah, right, right. the bow would have been drawn back yes. this way, okay. And uh, what comes after this, after this? After that would have been a composite prod which was constructed of whalebone, yew or ash, animal sinew, and then a the whole lot will be wrapped up in parchment. So in other words, they've got greater range, greater um, sort of power. You can get anywhere up to 270 metres. What damage could that do to a man or a horse? A man at arms on horseback. A crossbow bolt went through his armored, one side of his armoured leg, through the other side of the same leg, through the armour again, through the saddle of the horse, and into the horse. So in other words, any guy who can afford one of these, who doesn't have to be a knight, can take out a king with a single shot. That's correct. And we know that because we, you know, Richard I, you know, crossbow to the shoulder. It was totally against the laws of chivalry to be killed by an archer or a crossbow man. It's very unfortunate. Because they were lowball, they were baseball. Yeah. It just wasn't on, it, it wasn't the done thing. And that changed, changed the rules of warfare. Yeah. It's a great the, leveller, in other words, the crossbow. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah. But the big question for me is, are there any of these which I can fire? Please. <laughs>
they can all be fired because it's the wrong term to use. Ah. We shoot, we don't fire. Right, okay. Okay, let's give you a replica of a hand drawn 15th century. Nice and easy. All right, you come around the side. Yep. Now, how do I get the, uh, the drawstring back? Is okay. That... Put, nose it down to the ground. Uh huh. Put your foot in the stirrup. Yep. Now, keep him, I will keep the nut engaged. Keep him both hands on the string. Mm -hmm. Draw back. It's only 110 pounds. Oh, nothing. Right, and the bolt. Okay. Right, now, one of the things that occurs to me is this is quite straightforward, popping it in here and, and uh, firing it, shooting it, Please sorry. keep that thumb down. Okay, let's keep the thumb down. What if you were on the top of a castle parapet, you leant forward and that happened? Beeswax in the groove, spit in the groove, or a bolt trap? A bolt trap, what, what's that? A bolt trap will be a thin sliver of cow horn. Uh -huh. secured to the tiller behind the nut. Ah, right, and so you've, you're always going to have something gripping the bolt there, so that's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Okay, I'll put the bolt in. You okay. just worry about where you're going to shoot it. Okay. Is this roughly right? You just squeeze everything up. Oh, that's not bad. I hit the target. Crossbows were so despised that contemporaries claimed they had been invented by the devil. There's one particularly tabloid chronicler called Roger of Wendover who tells a tale about William de Albini and a crossbowman stood on top of Rochester Castle and the crossbowman having John within his sights. And he asks Albini whether he should kill the king. And Albini thinks on it and says, it's not for man to kill a king, that's for God to decide. Now, it's probably a made-up story, it sounds a bit dodgy to me. But it does show one thing, it shows that people were frightened of the crossbow and they knew how lethal it was, that even a lowly crossbowman was able to take out a king. Armed with their deadly crossbows and protected by Rochester's mighty defences, the rebels were proving to be formidable opponents. The king is going to expect a castle like this to surrender, he's going to expect the siege to end. John's got logistical problems of his own, he's, he, he can't just check all his army into a hotel, they've got nowhere to stay, he's got hundreds, maybe thousands of men out here in the open elements. He, he's got to feed them, he's got to keep them free of disease and cholera. It's a logistical nightmare. But John had the ultimate weapon. A terrifying engine of war. The trebuchet would have struck fear into the rebels' hearts. And King John had five of them. At Caffili Castle in Wales, they have built an exact replica of this 12th century catapult. It can be quite unnervingly beautiful that this thing is really a very unpleasant war machine, but it looks so graceful when we're demonstrating yeah. it here. OK, loose! It's like a bowler bowling a cricket ball. It's incredibly graceful in a way, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It totally captivates you as, as, the, as the, 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 the missile leaves, but it's, as you say, a very deadly weapon. Right, OK, chaps, first positions. They work on the principle of counterweight. So in the ballast box, we have approximately two tonnes of rocks and soil. Well, the trebuchet was originally invented by the Chinese in about the 10th century AD. It was a very simple machine then. It didn't have a counterpoise box on it. It had ropes, and people just hauled with muscle power on the ropes. Heave! And it's the Arabs who devise the counterpoise box ah. as being a way of improving the mechanical hey. efficiency of these engines. Right. So this is a new technology of the 12th century AD. Hey. Uh, Rochester, John's got five of these, and, and this is a baby one. How big are John's ones going to be? This trebuchet here has an arm length of 20 hey. feet. We know that the maximum size of these engines would have had an arm length of about 50 feet. They are the most devastating hey. weapon of the Middle Ages. No one has seen anything like this before. Remember, we are definitely pre-gunpowder hey. artillery. This is hey. the heaviest artillery that people have. Oh, so, so pretty heavy, then. Yes. And now, this is uh, made of stone? Hey. This is cast concrete. Oh, right. But the originals would have been carved stone, made by stonemasons, round because hey. they'll fly through the air better, and the same weight, so they'll hit the same target time after time. OK. How quickly could you load one? Ten minutes usually, if we really tried with a good crew, about six to eight. Six to eight. So yeah. if you had five of them, yeah. and you kind of worked in series, you could yeah. almost have sort of one going off every minute. Yeah. OK, trigger's engaged. Okay. We're now going to disconnect the winch rope. 
Part of the effect of this is to demoralise people. You see this thing being built in front of the castle. You know you are going to be bombarded. It's not just stone balls coming over, it's rotting carcasses, the heads of troops who've been out on a sortie, perhaps being hurled back. OK, bring the sling forward. They would have been very good at demolishing timber buildings, and certainly the roof of a keep would have had little defence mm, sure. against the stone balls going through. Also, it will demoralise the people inside, because they can't escape the bombardment. I think it looks like they're about ready to fire. I think Paul's waiting for someone else to help him to shoot the machine. Would you like to be the trigger I man? Kind of, I think I always wanted to fire a medieval trebuchet. OK. Good hide, Yang. And run away. Which way? Away from the engine is favourite. Right. Prepare the loose. Loose. Go on. Hi there. Prepare the loose. Loose. Oh, nearly. OK, let's try again. Prepare the loose. Loose. again. Loose! One of the chroniclers, the Barnwell analyst, tells us that the barrage did not cease day or night. One of the reasons why the men in the keep held out for so long was because they were hoping the cavalry were going to arrive soon. The leaders of the main rebel army in London had promised that if John attacked, they would come and help. Some way into the siege, about 700 knights did ride out from the capital, but when they got to Dartford, their nerve failed. They turned and fled in terror. That says a lot for the size of John's army, that so many men would flee so quickly. Rochester's defenders were now on their own. John is pounding this keep with missiles. What's the commanding officer going to be doing? He would want to be visible and moving around his men in the most exposed positions, and he'll be wanting to direct action against the enemy. The last thing he wants is his men cowering behind these crenellations. He wants them engaging the enemy, taking the battle to the enemy. And we never must underestimate the effect of a few well-aimed shots striking the enemy, it will keep the enemy at bay, make their massive superiority less effective. But the King's giant throwing machines could not breach Rochester's 12-foot thick walls. The trebuchets had failed. What would John do next? The King was becoming increasingly fed up, but he had one more trick up his sleeve. He was going to drive a mine under the tower in an attempt to bring it crashing down. Undermining was with good reason the most dreaded device of siegecraft. But it took weeks on end, and the conditions the men worked in were dark, damp and dangerous. The process was so risky that it was only undertaken by the most determined commanders. But by now, King John was ready to go to any lengths in order to get at his enemies. Things are looking very, very bleak for William de Albini and his men trapped inside the keep. Now, this is only my guess, but I imagine they're probably out of firewood by this stage. They've burnt everything they can lay their hands on because it's getting cold or into the middle of winter. But I know for a fact that they've run out of food because the very reliable Barnwell chronicler tells us that the men have been reduced to living on the flesh of their own horses. And he adds that this was particularly hard for those that were used to fine living. So they're very, very cold and they're very, very hungry. How much longer are they going to be able to hold out against King John? The exact location of John's mine has long been a mystery. But this team of engineers and archaeologists is trying to trace it using a ground-penetrating radar system. By the time they've finished, we hope to have an accurate idea of the route the King's miners took. OK, Simon, you ready? Off you go. It's exactly the same technology we use for finding airplanes in the air, but now we're turning it upside down to try to find King John's mine under the ground. OK, keep going. One of those is the transmitter, so that's emitting a radar wave down into the ground. That hits something in the ground, say a change in the soil, and bounces back up, and the second one receives that radar wave. 
have you found anything interesting here? Well, we're certainly seeing a lot of different things in the soil, but what they mean we won't know until we get the whole picture. Again, quite a nice signal coming through. An officer of my regiment, the Dorsets during the First World War, wrote they didn't actually mind so much the sound of the mining, but what they really feared and really got worried was when they heard the mining stop, because that meant that the mine was just about to be blown by the enemy. We know that the mine was ready by the 25th of November because on that date, John wrote to his trusted servant, Hubert de Burr. He said, We order you that with all speed you will send to us by day and night 40 bacon pigs of the fattest and least good for eating in order to bring fire beneath the tower at Rochester. It wasn't food that John needed, it was fuel. I very much doubt that Sir Hubert de Burr had to personally round up those pigs. But whoever was lucky enough to get that job, once they were at Rochester, they would have been slaughtered, their carcasses would have been boiled down, the fat poured into barrels and the barrels packed under the keep with brushwood, bits of hay, other combustible material, and then eventually the whole thing set on fire. Deep in the tunnels, the kindling caught, and the pig fat crackled. One by one, the wooden pit props began to snap. Then, suddenly, the ground collapsed and the great keep shuddered and split. With a deafening roar, a quarter of the building came crashing to the ground. At last, John's determination was vindicated. Rochester's mighty 12-foot walls had finally been breached. This is the data that we collected this afternoon. On the left here, at the beginning of the profile, you can see a fairly continuous reflector just beneath the surface. And when we get up to the corner of the castle, which is just here, then suddenly the reflector package thickens up and it's full of chaotic reflectors in That's here. That's the rubble. That's the rubble filling John's mine. And the wall fell down into that space. That's really good. I mean, that's... That's it, it looks isn't really it? nice. We've got it. We found the mine. So where exactly is the mine on the ground? It's here. It runs just about underneath us, more or less where the Victorian wall runs. The amazing thing is that even after that tower had collapsed, the knights inside still refused to surrender. The reliable Barnwell Chronicler tells us that they used this wall, the great cross wall inside the keep, as a last line of defence. But now it was only a matter of time. Albini and the defenders were totally out of supplies. A few days later, the exhausted rebels surrendered. The siege had lasted almost two months. The Barnwell analyst concluded soberly, living memory does not recall a siege so fiercely pressed and so staunchly resisted. When you think about King John's reputation, bad-tempered, cruel and vindictive, plus the fact that he ordered the execution of his own nephew Arthur, you might expect that a siege like this one would end with a round of grisly executions. But it didn't. Bad as he was, even John would not have dared to break the code of chivalry. It demanded that one did not execute prisoners, at least not noble ones. <laughs> 
In the 12th and 13th centuries, if a nobleman survived the battle, his life was spared, a sort of medieval equivalent of the Geneva Convention. Instead of killing their political rivals, the chivalrous Normans preferred to ransom them. If you're able to strip a man of his worldly goods, especially his castle, then you don't need to kill him. This was not only a defeat for the barons, but also for the strongholds that they had thought would hold out against anything. The defeat at Rochester had left the barons feeling totally discouraged. The Barmore Chronicle commented that after the siege of Rochester, there were few who would put their trust in castles, and he was absolutely right. As the king moved into East Anglia, the castles at Colchester, Framlingham and Headingham fell in quick succession. It looked very bad for the remaining barons in London. But then all of a sudden, King John obliged everybody by dropping dead, an unfortunate side effect of overeating. With John's death, the cause for fighting vanished. Within a year, the war was over. John's nine-year-old son was crowned as King Henry III. One of his first actions was to reissue Magna Carta, the promises his father had broken, this time in good faith. So what was the fate of the castle? In the 1220s, the shattered keep of Rochester Castle was repaired and you can see some of those repairs in the two arches behind me. The big one on the left is an original 12th century arch, and it's got a little tatty 13th century arch built inside it. The medieval masons who rebuilt Rochester weren't interested in making it look pretty again or putting it back together piece by piece. They wanted it to be stronger, and to make it stronger, they rebuilt that tower round. Round so it would deflect missiles, and round so there were no corners that you could hack away with picks. King John's siege in 1215 had proved that the great stone tower was vulnerable. Castles in the 13th century were going to have to change.